Hello, this is Jim Chaffrey, executive producer and host of Rip Rap, the academic book television program. My guest today is Rebecca Bowers Sype, who will discuss her book, They Still Can't Spell, Understanding and Supporting Challenged Spellers in Middle and High School. Welcome to Rip Rap. Thank you. This is a really interesting book. Um, I think it's wonderful because it takes the whole process of learning how to spell out of some kind of dark ages and brings it into a much more comfortable yet competent place in a learning environment. How and why did you and your co-authors, Don Putman, Karen Reed Nordwall, Tracy Rosewain, and Jennifer Walsh, embark on this journey of discovery about spelling, a topic that so many, including students, insist is so important, but who also feel sometimes so helpless in figuring out ways to do it accurately, and a topic that too often becomes overwhelmed even as the size of the challenge is underestimated. Well, Jim, this book has been a long time in the process for me. Um, by the time I came to Michigan and started teaching at Eastern Michigan University, I'd been working with public schools for 25 years. And of course, across that 25 years, I have worked with so many kids who've had difficulty with spelling. And then I had children of my own both of whom are quite bright. Uh, my daughter's in grad school, my son's in college, but as I watched them come along, I watched each of them have different levels of, of problems with spelling. Uh, my daughter seemed to adapt to the difficulty she was having fairly easily, came up with lots of strategies. My son was not nearly so successful in doing so. So by the time I uh, connected with Don and Tracy and Karen and Jennifer, I had lots and lots of questions about spelling. Um, each of them are classroom teachers. At the time we started our teacher research project, Tracy was uh, teaching at, in Pinckney, Alaska at the high school level. Uh, Dawn was at Chelsea in the high school. Karen was in Livonia at the middle school and Jennifer was at Forsyth Middle School in Ann Arbor. So we had quite a spread of, of talents and, and interest and all coming together with questions about what's going on with spelling in our classrooms, particularly from the vantage point of as secondary and college teachers, what can we do now? I mean, is there anything that we could realistically do now to support um, these struggling spellers? And I also want to just point out that all of us are members of, of the National Writing Project. We've all been through um, multi-week summer invitational institutes. Mine years and years ago, I've directed writing projects for a long time. So we all came to this question with a really clear sense that spelling is a very small part of the overall writing process. Um, but what we had noticed is that for some of our students, even though we thought spelling was a small thing, and we could say, oh, don't worry about your spelling until we get to the final draft, you know, we'll take care of it in the final draft. For some of our students, spelling seemed to be a big enough obstacle that it actually appeared to be interfering with both their ability to write and their, their motivation to engage in writing. So it was taking on proportions that were far bigger than we thought it warranted. That's what I noticed, and I've noticed from my own teaching, is that the student's self-esteem gets mm -hmm. all tangled up mm -hmm. with it, and they really feel like if they can't spell that they're terribly deficient. Mm -hmm. Well, in our society, we have set things up to make people feel that there's something really wrong with them if they can't spell. Uh, in one study, uh, uh, it was, um, it was uh, highlighted that at least one out of five Americans are what they called closet poor spellers. I mean, some people will avoid writing altogether so that people won't know that they're, they're challenged spellers or poor spellers. They've internalized that to mean that if I can't spell, there's something wrong with my brain. If I can't spell, then I'm not as smart as somebody else. If I can't spell, well, obviously I can't write. And all of those are um, fallacies about spelling. Um, we, we, we can get into that in a lot of detail, but we know that there's no correlation between poor spelling and intellectual capability. Two of the people that I included just as sort of a control in the study were college professors, multiply published, very renowned people, one in linguistics, one in literature. Obviously, the fact that they had difficulty spelling wasn't something that was even a career um, liability for them. But the question is, why is that the case for some people and for other people who have the same kind of difficulty? There seems to be a huge stumbling block. 
Well, one of the things I really enjoyed was how you started trying to define what the problem is or what the nature of the mm -hmm. situation is. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that because you really get into a more fine-tuned appreciation. Sure. Um, the research started out with, as I said, four classrooms and then my classroom and some collegial interviews um, in addition to that. And what we did is we tried to take a look at people who were both self-identified and teacher-identified as challenge spellers. We collected data in lots of different ways. We had the students do first draft writing, talking about their own history as a speller. We looked at their final draft writing with an eye toward, well, what are they able to self-correct? We did spelling placement inventories uh, using Richard Gentry's inventory that's this very normed and, and widely accepted in the field. We did in-depth interviews, both the teacher did interviews and I did interviews of the, with the students to, to get some uh, deeper textured looks at their um, spelling instructional history uh, and other kinds of factors that might have influenced where they are as spellers. Oh, let's see, we did a visual memory, um, uh, a normed, nationally normed visual memory inventory to look at both short-term visual memory and long-term visual memory and just lots of other kinds of things. So we had lots and lots and lots of data to take a look at. Um, are you interested in some of the things? Oh, absolutely. That, okay. the, the next question would be, what kind of patterns did you well, see? Well, we found just, oh, I'll get lost in this. We found lots of different things. First of all, we found that um, for most of the challenge spellers, just in terms of the placement inventories, most of them were very successful with the inventories up until about grade four, three, four. Mm -hmm. But definitely by grade four, they started experiencing difficulty. Uh, on these inventories, when we hit a 50% um, misspell rate that would sort of be the, the top out in terms of proficiency. Um, and if you start taking that backwards, you start looking at what that means. In traditional spelling uh, instruction, we rely on, initially on, on sound letter relationship. And so phonics plays a huge part up until about grade two, going in between two and three. So we're very sound based. At about two, three, we start making a shift to looking at visual cues for spelling. How did it look when you saw it in print? You know, how did it look the last time you, 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 read, you wrote the word? Um, and then at about fourth grade, we start making another shift into meaning-based strategies. Can you break the word apart? Does it have a prefix, a suffix? Is there a root? Is there a rule that kind of governs that? Uh, so, so that's the traditional history. All the students, every single student in our study had a traditional spelling background. They could all recall list. They all had the notion that the list may have had some sort of uh, generalization, but they didn't know what that was. They all talked about uh, out of school support for spelling. It's often a mom, a dad, a grandma uh, who would drill them on the words. They would have words on Mondays, generally with a pretest, exercises Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, final test on Friday. They even talked about the words being posted on the refrigerator door. Yeah. I mean, it's the, it was like my background all over again. I mean, I, so I could really understand the kind of background that they had had. So when they started washing out on this test at about grade four, what that suggested to me is that they had had a really thorough background in phonics. But as you know, English is not a language that is consistently um, based on English phonetic structure. We invite words from all over the place. And so at about the point where we shift to, uh, shifted to visual-based cues, something happened. So the next thing that suggested to me was, well, let's check visual memory. And not, not surprisingly, every single individual had some degree of difficulty with visual memory most often more difficulty with long-term visual memory. So what that suggested to me is that, well, perhaps we should be working with meaning-based cues for spelling earlier for challenge spellers. So, so that's just one of the things that we looked at. Coming out of the long interviews, we just got all kinds of fascinating, fascinating observations. Like one young man was talking about the fact that he remembered a spelling rule that was something like, a before E except after, but I don't know what. Now, he even had the rhythm down. He had the cadence down for I before E except after C. But he didn't have the right letters. He didn't have, I mean, he just, it just went right past him. And he talked about the fact that on the spelling list that he had had, um, they would teach 
putting L-Y at the end of words. And they'd have all these words and you put L-Y at the end of the word. And he said, but we never looked at any time when you, it ended in this thing and you didn't put L-Y. And so I didn't know what to do. What happens when I come to that kind of a word? So what they were telling us over and over again was that the list, uh, the list approach to teaching spelling for these students is too fast, it's too shallow, uh, there's not enough attention to places where a generalization holds and what happens when it doesn't. So everything just moved too fast for them. For it's them all to taken out of context. And much of it's out of context. And so, I mean, I'll even think, think about this in terms of myself. Uh, I walked through the office a while back and one of the secretaries said, how do you spell schedule? You know, just out of the clear blue. And the first thing that happened, you know, what, what happens when I ask you, how do you spell schedule? What happens in your brain? You start thinking about, well, what... what do, you, do you picture the word, though? Yeah. Do you see it? First thing that happens to me is my brain will go completely blank. A word out of context like that will just close it down for a while. I mean, I'll sit and sketch it out, and then I've got it. But, but for many people, that visual recall in, in the head that happens with many people just, just doesn't happen. Well, I have to say, since I read your book, I started testing this out, talking with people. And what I'm finding out, the, the issues about spelling are very, very widespread. Mm -hmm. And that almost everybody has some words. Mm -hmm. uh, I know mine happens to be initiative. I mm -hmm. always leave out an I. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's just fascinating that as you talk with people in depth, they're, they're this being taught in a decontextualized way. Mm -hmm. Really, it, you know, there's different mm -hmm. ways they've compensated for it, but it's not a real sure process. It's interesting. Um, Jennifer, um, and I had many conversations as we started this process. And I have to really say that this is, my name's on the book, but these teachers help, I mean, they, they were just key to the process of the research and to writing the, the text itself. But Jennifer was talking about recalling the one word she misspelled in elementary school, the one word. And of course, you know, uh, for me, I looked back and I was not one of those highly challenged spellers who freaked every time we had a spelling test, but I remember it being a lot of effort, and, and I remembered that I would have words on the test on Friday, and I'd have to look the words up on Monday, you know, or I, I would substitute a different word on Monday in my writing because I wouldn't really remember or have a high confidence level that I knew how to spell the word. Uh, when I do workshops with teachers, and this has happened over years, I'll ask that question, you know, write, do a fast write, five or six minutes on your history as a speller. You know, what kind of instruction did you experience? You know, what happened with, with you as a speller? And people will write, and about, you know, 80% of the folks in the audience will look at me like, what are you talking about? You know, I had words, I learned words, took the test, that was the end of the story. And then there'll be a few who will share some struggles. You know, mom or grandma would drill them on the words, they'd write the words, they'd get in the spelling test, and they, they, they you know, they usually did okay, but they had to get the first word right, because if the first word didn't come, then the rest of the list might not come. You know, it was that kind of, kind of thing. But they may still feel like they didn't know the words really well on Monday. But then there'll be the person in the audience who'll cry and talk about biting their fingers down to the point where they bled on Friday before spelling test, and that every single week it was another occasion to feel stupid. I mean, and those are words that, that's a word that people use. They generalize that to the way that they felt. Every week I felt incompetent. Every week I was made to feel like a literacy fraud because I couldn't do this. And when it's turned into kind of a marker, mm -hmm. you know, so that uh, I think there, the phrase you used earlier was closet speller or spelling challenge. Closet I think, spellers. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people like that because mm -hmm. there's such a social... Um, you know, marker about if you can't do it. Well, this has happened in the United States fairly recently. You know, Benjamin Franklin actually said, a man cannot consider himself to be educated until he can spell his name at least six ways. Now, you look at that <laughs> and look at where we are now. We can blame it on IBM. Didn't they do the first selectric typewriter? Yeah. And, you know, we, we bought into this notion that spelling is really important. And that, I'm sure, we'll get to in this interview at some point. But we can't deny that right now, and we can't leave students with the notion that their spelling doesn't count, because when writing counts, it certainly counts. Well, and <laughs> you talk about the John, you quote, the quotation from this John in the introduction, I know they think I'm stupid, but I'm not. I'm good at lots mm -hmm. of things. I just can't spell. 
even when I study, I can't guarantee the words will come when I need them. Mm -hmm. But like you say, it's not that you're saying, you're excusing students from finding ways to do it, mm -hmm. but it's getting a different understanding. Before we go on a little bit with that, you, you had some pretty uh, pointed comments about this tendency for standardized testing as a way of looking at it. Well, if you look at what standardized testing generally does, um, it will give you a word spelled four different ways out of context of sentences, out of context of real writing, um, without the use of dictionaries or support, you know, for, for people who have any prob problems with that. When I was analyzing one of those tests a while back, I realized that three of the four spellings were phonetically viable. So for a person who is, whose strong suit is sound letter relationships, they can make three of those spellings work. If that individual suffers from um, some sort of deficit with visual memory, they, don't, they can't count on it looking right because it's out of context anyway. So they're, they're sort of at a double jeopardy on a standardized test of that nature. Um, one of the strongest recommendations that came out of our study is that, um, and I'll say this probably three times, we need to teach students strategies and we need to teach them resources and we need to be sure that they know they have to use the resources and then for heaven's sakes, don't ever take the resources away. Um, and that is just really critical for, for challenged spellers. If, if our goal is to improve their spelling, then we don't take their resources away. Well, and one of the things that fascinated me about your project is that you did use the students as your orientation. This, mm -hmm. That's the starting point. And, and it seemed in the past spelling was something that was like dictated, mm -hmm. literally, to the students saying, you've got to know this information. Mm -hmm. But there wasn't so much of a... Uh, orientation toward understanding, did they get it? Mm -hmm. Did they understand it? Were they able to actually use it? I mean, besides mm -hmm. taking it immediately into one sentence. Mm -hmm. And what other obstacles did they face and how could they overcome mm -hmm. those? Well, unpacking that a little bit, in the past, somebody someplace decided what words were important to know, put them in list, created some exercises, set the whole thing up, and that person was somebody way external to the classroom. So it wasn't even the classroom teacher who was making that decision. Um, one of the things that we did was to take a look at um, analyzing the students' writing. Uh, we wanted to see what they knew, what they didn't know, what were their common kinds of errors, and to involve the students in that process. So yes, the students were very much uh, a part of the process. They saw themselves as being part of the research team as they were self-analyzing and taking a look at their own work. We asked the question, um, well, I want to back up just a second because I, I, we've, we've missed something that I think is important. I want to talk a moment about the, the, what we found out about the spellers themselves, and then I'd sure. like for us to talk about what spellers need. What we found out is that, that you, we cannot generalize about one type of challenge speller. We were actually able to identify four fairly discrete categories of challenge spellers, all of them equally challenged. But the difference was that students vary radically in their investment in literacy. We interviewed young people who, uh, Ringo, for example, is a student who um, reads and writes all the time. He hangs out with kids who read and write. They, are write. they write novels and stories together outside of school. They have this like Dungeons and Dragons thing that they're writing. Uh, this was not unique. I mean, there were any number of students who see, see themselves as being highly invested in what they want to say. And because of that investment, they've created a number of strategies so that when they get to a final draft in their own writing, they have steps to take to be sure that that's, that piece of writing that's important to them is going to be communicable to an external audience. Uh, that's a category one challenge speller. If we move all the way down the line to category four, what we find are students who have associated reading and writing with pain and not pleasure. They will avoid writing in school and out of school whenever they can. And so they're, they are consciously not engaging in the, the very strategies and activities that would sort of have some hope of helping them to raise their overall awareness and investment in language. And because of that, um, 
we have sort of a different dilemma when we move from the highest categories to the lowest categories. Um, with students like Ringo, he needs strategies. He needs opportunities to uh, learn more uh, uses of rules and generalizations and strategies at work. When we get down to that last category, we need literacy investment. All the work in the world on spelling, apart from literacy investment, is apt to produce a, a fairly shallow return. Well, and you went even farther than that in the, in, toward the end of the book. You said our students are our teachers. They help us see what they need to continue their growth. I thought that was just really marvelous because it reoriented that whole question. And I think that's so true. When we take a look at student writing and we analyze that and we look at the strengths the student brings to the paper and then whatever kinds of, of areas we see as being areas for concentration, it will tell us what we need to concentrate on in many lessons and uh, short lessons uh, in the classroom and then reinforcement um, during the course of the school year. If, for example, we look at a typical set of eighth grade or first draft writing papers and we find that they're laboring over there and there, it's and it's, you know, all the homophone uh, errors, and that does tend to be a, a major issue, then that's a place to start. And the answer isn't necessarily giving them a list of words to memorize, it's setting up word walls or, you know, creating visuals or creating mnemonic devices so that, that the students will be able to begin seeing the distinctions between those words. And, and th that's important because those are words that they're using in their own writing. Um, if I take a look at student work and realize that they're having difficulty knowing when to drop a final uh, vowel to add a suffix or when to double a letter to add a suffix, then that may be a rule that I need to teach. And I may need to figure out ways to not only teach that, but to get it out there for a long enough period of time for students to really concentrate on it looking at both places where that rule holds and, and words that may be exceptions to that. The other thing I liked was that the approach is based on what you call the soft, consistent emphasis on word awareness. That was like the beginning place for the other strategies. Well, the teachers in the study tell audiences, I don't teach spelling in a big concentrated kind of way. It's sort of like the foundation. Word awareness is the foundation of what we do in my classroom. Whether we're reading literature, we're working on a piece of writing, there's that steady, soft, you know, awareness of spelling. Um, if I were looking at a working with a student like Josh, who, who was a, tr real, a tremendously challenged speller, in his writing, the first thing I'd want to do is to take a look at um, the big ticket items. What, what one or two words does he tend to have the most difficulty on? And then we would sit down with those words. We would probably do um, some sort of a spelling log, a reflection log, so he could take a look at the words, why he thinks he's having the difficulty with it, what kind of strategy he might be able to use the next time for that word, so that we're doing whatever we can to raise his awareness of the couple of words in a single paper that tend to be his most problematic ones. And then that word would go on his, his own spelling list. And he, he could put that in a notebook, he could laminate it and put it on his desk, so that those become words that he knows to look for in his editing. And then he has a guide that he can look at. For a challenge speller, they may need repeat work with a correct spelling of a word 80 or 90 times for it to imprint. On the other hand, I remember that I myself looked up the word accommodate every single time I used it for about 35 years. And then somebody said, you know, you just have to remember to accommodate the twins, you know. Double C, double M. I haven't looked it up since then. So sometimes that's all it takes is helping a student to come up with, a, uh, with some sort of um, device that they can use to be able to remember the spelling of a word. And you make the point, and I think you said a little bit earlier, that when you do a detailed analysis of what actually the students are doing, there tends to be patterns. Oh, sure. And so they'll be mm -hmm. making, and some of it isn't a, you know, they, they're <laughs> fixable. Some of them are a little more profound. Well, we've known for a long time that spellers don't make errors at random. Um, all of us, even proficient spellers, generally will have some words that give us difficulty, and they tend to fit into patterns. And so for classroom instruction, especially at the secondary level where the curriculum is already so uh, amazingly full and teachers simply do not have time to say, well, I'm going to stop everything and teach spelling for six months. 
that's just not going to happen. So what we, we suggest instead is look at the kinds of errors that your students make and then create short lessons that you can teach during the course of a regular semester to draw attention to those kinds of errors because they'll make the most difference in the student's paper. And be very visual. You know, create word walls. Uh, and for people who don't know about word walls, if we're looking at I before E except after C, that's a rule that everybody seems to know. Spend a lot of time on it. I mean, not in terms of instructional time, but put that up on the wall. Have kids go out and in the newspaper and in the literature when they're reading or just when they encounter a word that matches that rule, bring it in, put it on a card, and put it on the word wall. And then start looking for words that are exceptions to that and what governs the exceptions because there are logics in the language even for words that don't fit traditional English phonetic structure. There are logics for the way words are constructed. And so then you look for that and you create these things that become very visual. We encourage content teachers who are concerned about spelling, bless them, they are concerned about spelling. But if there are content words that a, a science teacher wants a student to spell correctly in even test situations, put them on the wall. You know, don't be afraid to put those words up for students to take a look at. I've actually watched young students, uh, third, fourth, fifth grade, get up out of their seat, go up to a word wall, and find a word because they remember someone put it up or they remembered who put it up. They may even remember where it is. They just don't remember how to spell it, but now I want to use that word. So they'll get up, they'll write the word down, come back, and it goes into their writing. It's a very reinforcing kind of um, approach to spelling. Well, and that's what I liked is that not only did you have this more complex um, sorting out of what the problem is, but then they had multiple strategies to, you know, exactly. gave you more ways to configure a response. Interestingly, as we interviewed the challenge spellers, many of the most the most labored of our challenge spellers, the ones who had the least literacy investment, didn't realize that there were strategies that good spellers use. I mean, they had one or two strategies, like use a spell check, ask the teacher, ask my mom, and beyond that, well, my great grandpa couldn't spell either, so, you know, it's just all way too complicated. There's one other really big point with the book, and, and its usefulness as a tool, because you've included a lot of material at the end of the book that will help teachers mm -hmm. and parents we and so. people who are interested in the spelling issue. We hope so. Um, and, and there's lots and lots of material out there too, but just helping people to have ready access to prefixes, suffixes, roots, and different kinds of ways that you can, you can work with those in a classroom, and suggesting suggestions for word walls and suggestions for how you might be able to teach a rule and to teach it deeply, you know, so that it's very textured. Um, we are, we're really hoping that this will be a, a resource that teachers can draw on. Well, thank you for being a rip -rap. Thank you so much for having me. This has been great. <laughs>